Good evening and welcome to Between the Lines. I'm John Matteson. Tonight we're going to be looking behind the numbers of the elections we've just had in South Africa. These municipal elections were historic, they were dramatic, they presage some changes, but what, what are the changes they presage? My guest tonight is Professor Robert Matters of the University of Cape Town. He's a political scientist. He's, he's, he's American, but in fact you've been here since 1990. 1990, so not, yes. Not, yeah. not new. No, not at all. Uh, welcome, Bob. Thank um, you. We want to try to understand the future of our political parties from what the numbers tell us. But before we get into the parties, the first question I want to ask is, how should we read the turnout? Turnout came in at 58%. I've seen different versions of what that tells us. Yeah, I mean, according to the IEC, and, and the number is accurate, of registered voters, around 6 in 10, 58% came out to vote. And that's about uh, almost exactly where we were in 2011. But the last two elections have been far more participatory than the first two elections, which were um, under 50% registered voters. However, there, there, there's a bit of sleight of hand going on here. The IEC reports percentages of registered voters who vote, but the internationally um, comparable figure, the one that's used around the world to, to assess the health of democratic systems in terms of voter turnout, is percentage of voting age population. Right, so everybody in the country... Registered and unregistered. Exactly. Anybody right. 18 and over who could vote. Right. And right now the IEC estimates we've only got about 8 in 10 eligible voters registered. So if you do simple math, six, you know, around 58% of 80%, what that means is that we only have about 48% uh, of the voting age population came out and voted in this last election. And again, that's, that's higher than it was before, uh, especially in the first two elections when it was around a third. But what that means is, if you, and that's just an average, right? so that means in many communities, it's 40% or below 40% of eligible voters who came out to cast a ballot. It also means that at any given election, over the last few elections, both national and, el and, and local, the largest single vote is the no vote. So the number of no vote uh, abstainers is larger than the, the actual number of people voting for the ANC, and clearly much larger than the people, number of people voting for the, for the opposition parties. And th that has something to say about the health of our democratic system. Um, I think it's even more concerning uh, Let's look at the, at the national level. The, the percent voting in the last uh, national elections in South Africa was about the same as the United States. And everybody knows the United States has some of the lowest levels of turnout. In the, That's in the national election. In the national election in the industrialized world. And how do we compare with the rest of the world on, on municipal elections? Uh, I, I don't know. There's not a lot of good data around on municipal elections. But in terms of national elections, if we compare us to the, other, the rest of the democratizing world, we're in the bottom half. It's better than some, but worse than most. And in the first election or two, we were very high. Very high. So turnout as a, as a percentage of eligible voters went from 88% uh, in 1994 to by 2004, 58%. Uh, so it fell by, by almost 30 percentage points in just wow. eight years. Now, it leveled off after that. We've been around 58% since then. Uh, but it's even more concerning. So if you just use the comparison with the United States, one reason why so few people vote at, at, at national elections in America or in Switzerland, which also has low turnout, is they vote all the time. The ballots are long. You have uh, choices from dog catcher to judge to, to senators to Congress to president. It's a very long ballot. And there's party primaries. There's referendum. Um, there's congressional, state. Uh, there's constant voting. Uh, where voting is, is more scarce, voting tends to be higher. And that's more concerning in South Africa because we only have one national election in which we get to cast two ballots and a local election where we get to cast two ballots. So that's four ballots over a, a five-year time span. One would just expect more voting. Right? So given that we have so few opportunities, it is concerning that, that so few people actually come out and to take, a, take, take account of, their, uh, of these opportunities. The one thing that seems to predict where South Africa is, is not its age of democracy, it's not its level of wealth, it's not even the electoral system we use, it's the level of competition. So we know that the, the, the turnout comes up in the middle when the governing party is winning between 45 and 55 percent of the vote. Right. Once it goes above 55 percent consecutively, turnout starts coming downwards, like but, in South Africa. But in this case, you had a slightly different phenomenon. What some commentators are saying is that the DA voted in high numbers, and the ANC had a high stay away. 
so I was looking at some survey data collected by citizen surveys in the, in the run-up to the election. It's very clear then, and it has been, that DA voters are already much more motivated. Right? They're already, I mean, we know socioeconomic status is a strong predictor of voting. So if you look amongst that first third of the electorate in the, in the sample who were very committed to voting, the DA is doing very well amongst that group. Once you move to the next stratum, DA support falls down, ANC support goes up, and, if you, and unfortunately for the EFF, it's, you look at the voters who were least likely, least likely to be registered, least motivated, least likely to have voted in the previous election, that's where EFF support lies. Right. So their support lies amongst the group of people who are hardest to get a hold of, the hardest to turn out to vote. And that's something they're going to have to work on in the future. But before we get to the specifics of each party, uh, the last question on the ANC's low turnout, was that a political protest stay away vote? Look, uh, one reason is the ANC support is strongest in areas where they, don't, where they are politically dominant. So if we know the comp competitiveness, contestation is one thing that brings voters out, it's harder for the ANC to get voters out in the Pumalanga and the Northwest simply because they are much but, more dominant. But what about Joburg and Chwani and Nelson Mandela, where they seem to, they, they work, it was a competitive race and their numbers seem to go down? Well, I'm not, sh I'm not clear about that yet, but I know if you look at, uh, at just provincial results, Turnout is highest in Western Cape, Gauteng, uh, and, and it starts coming down the more, the more the province is rural and the more it's ANC dominated. So within elections across, across provinces and across the metro, turnout will be highest in the areas where elections are, are perceived to be more, uh, most competitive and most advantageous to bring out the opposition voters. Okay, let's, let's go on to the parties. First of all, the Democratic Alliance. Um, what is the what what happened to the democratic alliance's ceiling well the idea of a ceiling i think has always been debatable um look it, it, in all the voting analysis that i've done over the years one of the clear uh, a couple of things first of all voters are just not voting their racial identity uh, they're voting based on they're not no it, it looks like that but it's mostly that, 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 that black voters are generally more likely to have an optimistic view of how the government is doing. Now, people in the middle class and civil society, we often sit back and say, look at the state of the schools, look at the state of this, look at the state of that. Why do they keep on voting for the ANC? But if you ask voters um, across a range of performance areas, they are very negative when it comes to say how the government is doing and creating jobs or keeping prices low or managing the economy. So they're very sophisticated and say only about 20, 25% will approve of the way the government is handling its job. Then you ask about social welfare, you ask about education, you ask about health care, um, and the government gets very good marks, 70 to 80%. So when voters are coming to the polls, they're balancing all these things out and not necessarily focusing on the issues that people in the news media and civil society think are the most important ones. Uh, and even if the schools look bad to many people sitting, again, in middle class society. The social grants are there, there are other positive Or most people things. saying, look, at least I'm, my kids are in school. I wasn't in school. Right. Uh, the, 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 the advantage, the, the improvement in my lifetime is, is enormous, and I give credit for the ANC for that. We have to break, Bob. Uh, we'll be right back with Professor Bob Matters. And we're back with Bob Mattis talking about the election results. Um, the DA had something of a breakthrough. Uh, they could be, they'll be um, working on governments at all sorts of levels where they didn't exist before. Is it sustainable? Will they win at a national level as well as they've well, done at a local level? Let's just maybe answer that by looking at what got the party there. I think two things. One is increasingly bad performance by the ANC, especially at national level. Even though these are local government elections, it also serves as a kind of a referendum on the president, on national conditions, on perceptions of which direction the country is going to. And all those things we know are important uh, predictors over past elections of how people vote. But another important thing, and we've asked a question in, in, in previous surveys of voters saying, for each party, do you think it stands for all South Africans or one group only, or don't you know? And what's very clear is the ANC has uh, about 70 to 80 percent will say they're inclusive of all, all of the entire country. Uh, when it comes to the opposition, however, far fewer people are sure of that. 
Um, it's not the case, though, that, many, that, that, that the majority of black voters see the DA as a white party, but they simply don't know who it stands for and what its position is. Now, that has been improving slowly over time. The, uh -huh. the DA has been working on that, on that image problem, uh, sometimes very clumsily. But I think, and we, we haven't asked that question since Musi Mamani became leader, but my sense is that's made a huge difference. So having a national leader to, to really change that image of, of, of the overall brand of the party and who it is, having a, a cause speaking candidate in, 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 in Nelson Mandela Bay. Um, so, so I think it's been able now to send out the image the party is changing, and it has and the interests of black voters at heart. And, and maybe uh, uh, claiming the mantle of Nelson Mandela's non-racialism, given that the uh, President Zuma was, was playing a race card, uh, may, have, may, have, may have been a, a good strategy for it. Possibly, or at least making the, the claim, even yes. if it's rejected, making right. the claim and, and, and right. being a player for that, for that, for that legacy is, I think, is quite useful. Um, and the other thing is, is the advent of te television. So the DA now has a very talented, uh, media-friendly black leader who can go into the homes of, of millions of voters who previously the DA didn't ha doesn't have a, political, uh, a labor union working with it to, it, to do the, the ground game, right, to knock on doors any way that matches the ANC. Uh, so again, our surveys over the year have shown about 30% of people will be contacted during the election, 30, 35%, but the vast majority by the ANC, very few people get contacted or get have their door knocked on or get reminded to go out and vote by opposition because the opposition simply doesn't have that kind of organizational strength. Television helps opposition parties, especially ones who are well-funded, to cut into that very significantly. So we now have free advertising time to all parties, but, all, but, other, but parties are also allowed to buy additional advertising time. So if you then now uh, have, maybe in, Helen Zilla might have been a bit stilted, a bit uh, hard, to, hard to make that sell, but if you have Mamusi Mamani speaking for the party, I think that makes a difference, especially amongst uh, maybe black middle class voters, and is responsible for, and let's not oversell the rise. It, it hasn't been a significant amount of votes that they, I think, have taken from the ANC, but it's still, uh, modest. It's commonly said that the Democratic Alliance has a, has a firm ceiling because of its white and maybe colored and Indian support, can't get across to Africans. How far did it break through that ceiling? You know, when we look at, uh, and again, we don't know how people voted according to race, that's, that's not possible to tell until we do actual surveys of people. But if you look, if you go to the IEC website, for example, and drill down to areas that we know of as historically black areas, townships, right. It looks like moving from 2 to 3 percent to 9 to 10 percent. But there have been much more significant uh, trends in, in uh, certain municipalities where there's been, uh, so if you look at the platinum belt, right. Right, where the ANC really suffered some, some major losses in some of the metropolitan, uh, not metro, but, but munici large municipalities, such as Rustenburg. The ANC went from 70, 72 percent down to 40 percent of the vote between two local government elections. That's a very astounding Huge. drop. Now, so that's a 30 point drop. 20 of that can be accounted for by the rise of the EFF, right? but that's only 20. The other 10 obviously had to go. So if you think about 10% kind of ideologically shifting to the left of the ANC, uh, the other 10% shifting to the right to the DA. So it's clear that in, in many metropolitan areas, uh, uh, Johannesburg, uh, 20, and a lot of the smaller um, municipal areas, the decline of the ANC vote is not just accounted by voters moving uh, a leftward, but also many voting, moving toward the DA. So, I suppose the bottom line really can't be found in the numbers. If the ANC get their act together, they could restore support. If they don't, the DA could continue to sustain its growth. And, I, and again, I, I have no evidence specific from this election, but looking at previous uh, uh, data from surveys from previous elections, we know images of the president and images of the overall direction of the country are very important in how people vote. And I think it was the ANC needs to think about is who its standard bearer is at the next election, um, but also who is the president in the run-up to that, right? That, that if Zuma is still in the, inc uh, the incumbent president, that's going to cast a pall over whoever is succeeding him. The damage will continue. I, I would say so, especially if there's not a really sharp, drastic uh, uh, change in the overall direction of the country and the strength of the RAND and, the, and, and prices and, 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 and overall events around cor corruption, uh, uh, the ANC still has that, has that uh, noose around its neck. And if you even think in terms of, if, 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 if you have a very negative view of the ANC and say that it's not a party of ideology anymore, it's simply a party of patronage. Right. Uh, the ANC really needs to take into account that you know, in 2000, between 2009 and 2015, uh, 
the last two national government elections, yeah. it has lost a very significant number of parliamentary seats that it could have given out uh, that they had in 2004. So Zoom has presided over two successive reductions in the number of seats it has to give out in parliament, also a reduction in seats it can give out in parliamentary, uh, provincial parliaments across the country, and now a very sharp reduction in the number of seats it can get out in local municipalities. So in just in terms of patronage, it's a much reduced party compared to what, where, what would have been in 2004. And if nothing else, uh, ANC rank and file need to think about that because it's simply there's less to give a, to, to, to dish around. What it suggests, and we're going to need to take a break on this, but it suggests that the problems the ANC has are being pushed below the surface by the leadership because they didn't debate them, they didn't discuss the president's position. But, but those are going to percolate over the next few months. But I'm afraid we have to take a break then. We'll be right back. And we're back talking to Professor Bob Mattis from the University of Cape Town. Um, Bob, I, I do want to ask about the economic freedom fighters. Uh, I think, it, would it be fair to say they've proved they're not COPE? In other words, they're not the party that yep. collapsed uh, after a first good election when they broke away from the ANC. But their growth has been also contained. They went up from six something to eight something percent. Uh, and partly, I suspect that was because they didn't have money. I, I think a combination of things, money, and we've already mo mentioned uh, the, the growing importance of television, uh, television advertising in South African politics. So they're, they're not there. They're not playing the game that the ANC and the DA are playing. Uh, but you know, let's let's be clear that the leadership, uh, you know, Julius Malema, turns on a very significant part of the electorate, but it's but it's a small part of the electorate. Uh, if you look at overall evaluations, if you look at surveys, the citizen surveys have been doing in the lead up to the election. Um, the overall favorability of Julius Malema amongst black voters is very limited. Really? Yes. Um, so I think you know, he, he excites younger voters, but again, that's, that's the AFS problem because that's the segment of the electorate that's least likely to come out and, uh, and uh -huh. vote and be registered and, 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 and take an active part, part in politics. So they did grow, but that growth is, uh, you know, part of, its, part of its power in the last few years has simply been the specter it posed to the ANC, the fear that if the ANC didn't turn sharply left working on some issues around land, for example, that they were going to shed a lot more support. Well, that really didn't happen. It happened in some very significant, a very small number of, of limited municipalities where the EFF concentrated their work, such as at Rustenburg. Uh, a, a, a few municipalities in, 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 in Pumalong and Northwest. So where they concentrated their efforts, they did show some very significant growth into double digits and often sometimes even over 20%. But right now as a national organization, it doesn't, I don't think has that ability to do that on a national scale. So it's gotta be very strategic in where it, it launches its, its, its attempts to really make an input. Um, whether it can sustain that again, is, is, it's, up, it, it's, it's an issue of money, it's an issue of machinery. And it's an issue of trying to grow beyond just having a youth um, support base. Well, that suggests that, uh, I mean, I think one of the reasons for their success has been the skill of, and st strategic skill of the leadership. I mean, Julius Malema is charismatic, so is Floyd Chirambu. Um, but uh, it may be that they're the ones with the ceiling. Yeah, because char you know, charisma takes you only so far. Um, again, winning elections is about organizational skill. It's about contacting voters. It's about getting out the vote. And intergenerational support, which you're saying As they well. don't have. Yeah, because I think uh, a lot of its uh, uh, tactics in Parliament on television have, I mean, they, they had a wonderful national tele uh, uh, platform on television to get free air time to tell the voters who they are for. And again, the kind of uh, destructive uh, uh, tactics it, it pursued, I think, turned on some voters, but most voters saw this as not saying that this is not what we want for the country. Especially older, more rural, more conservative black voters were very much turned off by uh, what they saw or what they heard about happening in Parliament. To go back to the ANC, uh, the ANC is you know, the oldest party uh, in Africa, They've been so powerful, uh, started in 1912, uh, yet now it seems to be facing a crossroads. Is the ANC uh, going... Is there any way to judge if the ANC will get back those it lost? Well, I think it, 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 it um, first of all, voters who voted for you, uh, that's always the first group of voters that's likely to get back if you can show that you've learned your lessons. 
uh, if you've eliminated the negative parts of your party and if you start showing that you're performing uh, again. And some of that is at the local level, but a lot of that is simply just the direction of, of, of the national economy, the sense that uh, the rand isn't in free fall anymore, that the, that the, uh, the prices aren't skyrocketing out of control, uh, and then there's some kind of stability returning to the country. And I think that's, that whole series of events around the economy, around uh, arguments and scandals over certain individuals, certain appointments, uh, the president's own personal problems, uh, all of that has really come together to, to have a very unfavorable environment for the ANC electorally in the last election. Um, putting an end to that has got to be its first uh, electoral uh, task. I don't want to put words in your mouth, but you, it seems as if one is saying that for the ANC to recover, Zuma has to go. Or he's got to be put on a very tight rein, uh, and in a sense, uh, somebody else takes control in the Treasury and the Deputy Presidents, for example, to try and put the, right, the, right the ship of, of, of state in terms of uh, getting the economy under control again, reassuring voters that, that, that prices aren't going to be out of reach, that they can start uh, maybe thinking about buying a house, and, and all those things that ordinary people are concerned about. Mm. Well, it, it, it's, it's going to be fascinating. Uh, I don't think we're, we're going, to, going to take it further tonight. Um, this week I'm recommending a book about Kenya's Thule Modern Seller, equivalent of the Public Protector. I'm doing it because, as we know, we're, we're, we're in, we're, the parliament is looking at who to, who to replace Thule Modern Seller with, the person who, who, who will be in charge of the battle for, against corruption. The book I'm looking at is actually not a new book. It came out a few years ago. It's called It's Our Turn to Eat by Michaela Rong. And it's the story of a Kenyan whistleblower, John Gitanga, who was really the equivalent of Tuli Manutsela in Kenya. There are some remarkable things about this book uh, because it, it talks about the feeling of what it was like when he was appointed. He was appointed because he was known to have integrity. There was a new president. But he makes something very... Uh, makes a very important point. He says, and this dovetails with what we've been saying, um, he had a meeting with the president before he took the job, and he said, Mr. President, we can set up all the anti-corruption authorities we want, spend all the money we want, pass, pass all the laws on anti-corruption, but it all depends on you. If people believe the president is eating, in other words, taking money from the, gov from the taxpayer, the battle is lost. If you are steady on this thing, if the leadership is there, we will succeed. Sadly, uh, J J John Gitanga concluded in the end that this was not the case, that he was being used. People were putting him there because they needed his reputation to impress foreign donors and so on. But in fact, he couldn't survive. Uh, he resigned. Uh, he left the country. He came back. But he's never really recovered. But he does feel... That, that, that this was a worthwhile step and that next time maybe Kenya will succeed. This is a problem we've seen in many parts of uh, Africa. It's a problem we've seen in South Africa. Um, but the book is interesting because the author, Michaela Rong, who's a British uh, foreign correspondent, dissects who you can trust among the donors, who you can trust among the, the diplomats, who you can't. The problem is, is, is much wider than just one country, and she particularly focuses on the Western companies and Western governments that play their part in the continuing corrupting of Africa. Well, that's our show. Thanks for watching. Uh, good night and happy reading. Okay.